good size of people on the last release, and the number of people who are on legacy releases forever are um, decreasing. So that's um, kind of nice to see, because we've had people who are kind of clinging on to Fedora 15 for a long time. There's actually, back to this one, there's an um, interesting drop here. Uh, Fedora 14, sorry, is the one people are clinging on to. There's an interesting drop um, about a year ago where a huge number of Fedora 14 um, systems went away from the statistic. We don't know why. Uh, maybe they all decided to upgrade to RHEL 7. Maybe they switched to some other thing. Um, it's, it's a whole number, large number at once. So I think it was probably a host and farm or something that was running Fedora. But really, um, we don't have a lot of information <coughs> from this. So there's a lot of guessing there. Uh, you can also see here that tiny little light sliver there. That's the brave people who are running Rawhide. So uh, thanks to everybody running Rawhide. I assume that's some of the people who are running Rawhide. So 
I have a pie chart, which is hopefully easier to read here. And so this one, I had another one of these at um, DevCon earlier this year. This one I think is a little more rigorous, so I um, was, last time I didn't put numbers on it, I just had the pie chart, and I guess about this one I actually feel a little more confident. It still has all these caveats, it's sketchy IP counting rather than um, anything else, and particularly downloads don't really show usage in any way. Someone could download it and throw it away, or they could download it and install 10 systems in a lab, or they could download the cloud image and run one million of them. We have no way of knowing from that what, the, what those are, but basically to break down uh, Fedora Workstation, 68% of the downloads, uh, and Server, 14%. Uh, and this one, um, I also we also included the net installs here, and the, net, the breakdown for the net install which is about 10% of the overall downloads is net install, and that has basically the same ratios for the workstation and server uh, there. Uh, so the cloud image comes in at 4%, KDE at 5%, which is actually quite a bit up from the previous number. So I think that the new Spins website is working. People who are interested in trying out the alternate desktops are able to find that and explore that. Well, so that's kind of, that's cool. Um, LXDE and XF uh, about two and a half percent each, uh, and sugar uh, and uh, mate uh, like one percent, and then there's a tiny sliver of other things there, which I guess are probably the labs. It seems very very small, so I don't know if that possibly if those weren't counted right, but I think maybe there's just not very many downloads of those. Those are going to be very special purpose bits. Okay, um, here is CPU architectures. So we have x86 64. And 32-bit going kind of across and decreasing there. You see down in the tiny little corner there, that little bit of red, that's ARM. <laughs> <laughs> and I should add, this is back to young connections, not downloads. So there might have been, uh, again, um, a lot of boards out there that are not actually connecting for regular updates and things like that. So I think the ARM thing actually reflects probably people using ARM on the desktop rather than using ARM for um, cute little embedded hack kind of thing. And uh, because we're talking about ditching 32-bit uh, Intel architecture, I uh, broke this down a little bit more into a pie visualization for you here. Uh, this is basically, you can see the gigantic blue 32-bit six years ago, getting smaller, and now down to a much smaller little wedge now. And um, I don't know if you can see it, but again, you can kind of see a tiny little sliver of arm there up there that's playing with Steam as well. But uh, basically, I think we are probably um, right in saying you know, the trend is 32-bit Intel is going away. Um, and if we uh, want to move that to secondary, um, we're getting to the time where that's a good thing to do. Matt? Yeah. At what point do we switch to default downloads? That is a really good question. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's no gigantic jump at any point that says, "Oh, look, we switched the default download," uh, at least for the for the um, for the installed systems. But I don't know what the case is for the. I think it was for our twenty that the switch. For really, it was, it was pretty recent. So Fedora twenty, yeah, Fedora twenty would be somewhere near the. Possibly, it's you can see here on the thirty-two bit. There's actually kind of a chunk down and another chunk down at the end there. Those those chunks down do correlate to releases there, so maybe that's uh, So um, if the Intel architecture didn't exist, this is just the secondary architectures here. Um, again, the big red spike there is, is ARM, and there's all of our other, other things. Uh, I think PowerPC is the other um, slightly significant one, um, and I, I cannot see the label, so that's PowerPC and Sign. Probably out of the control. I think. Sorry, it's just over the degree. Yeah. Uh, which one is cyan? Oh, RPC. And which one is the orange? Red Spark. Yay, Spark. Awesome. Uh, apparently, there's still a pretty good Spark. There's a Spark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, the last thing uh, on my connection stats slides here uh, is this is um, basically all the young connections that are uh, Fedora operating system connections, Fedora updates. It's the green line, 
and the red line is ethyl. So uh, not only is ethyl, is, so we've known for a while ethyl has exceeded our number of connections since 2012, uh, but it continues to grow quite a bit in popularity and ethyl 7 is taking off. Uh, so this is an area where we as Fedora have a big impact beyond the Fedora uh, operating system itself, and so this is something that people really appreciate and something that is very, very well used. Um, so uh, I guess that's all I have to say about that right now, but it's worth talking about more over the course of slot here. Uh, all right, uh, back to Velociraptors from the beginning. Uh, like I said, I, these statistics tell us a lot of interesting things, but a lot of it is kind of conjecture and guesswork. I would really like to have a more accurate census of the number of Fedora machines out there. And I know we talked uh, two years ago at Flock about um, running a census system automatically. Um, and there was kind of, uh, not just kind of, there was a lot of resistance to that uh, for privacy concerns. And people wanted to have an opt-in system. I know we tried an opt-in system before with Smolt and it was not particularly successful. Um, I would like to suggest that we have an opt-out system that just sends a randomly generated machine ID and the Fedora version and what edition or spin it is um, with um, a lot of care taken to getting the privacy concerns right. Um, maybe you know, not logging IP addresses even. Like here, here we're logging IP addresses. Uh, we can actually reduce the amount of private information we store by getting rid of that and just having a unique ID so we stay there. And those unique IDs um, can be used for just counting, not for tracking, so we can rotate them once a month or something like that so you can't be tracked over time. I don't really care about tracking. It, it, it's fun to track the same system over time, but not particularly useful from an aggregate point of view. So I would like to, over the next release or so, figure out a way to do something like that and then also have opt-in to more elaborate statistics because it really helps us figure out you know, who our audience is and what we're targeting when we can sort of count what people are using. Uh, I, I know it's sensitive, so we'll try and approach that in a really careful way, but I wanted to point that out. We can at least uh, put some of the dinosaurs in the ground if we, if we can work with that. Okay, uh, so switching to some other statistics. This is from Fedora Magazine, which uh, Ryan Lurch and Chris Roberts and some of the people have worked on very hard over the year. This is the statistics over the past year for um, visitors in the lower, the inside parts of Barcraft and the page views for the top. Uh, so uh, the peak month here in May, when we had a new release, uh, we had 100,000 visitors. Uh, that's unique visitors, uh, not just people reloading every day. 100,000 unique visitors to the magazine that month, which um, I think is a Pretty, pretty good audience. Um, it uh, pretty much corresponds to the number of people who are making yum connections every day as well. So I don't know, maybe everybody who uses Fedora looked look at the magazine that month. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the things, uh, I was talking to Ryan, one of the things that's interesting is that the articles that get the most views are ones that are very user focused, not contributor focused. So we get a lot of attention when we talk about desktop applications and desktop technologies. Uh, a lot of a lot of love for GNOME in, on the magazine. We get a couple comments saying that you know GNOME is terrible. You should switch to um, whatever Highland Window Manager or, or instead. Um, but uh, our actual page views and um, it are very high. People are very interested in GNOME, you know, so I think that's an interesting uh, interesting thing. Uh, and so uh, we are also in the future working on having a separate Fedora contributors blog and kind of the Fedora hubs thing that will have the contributor-focused content there and make the magazine more and more user-focused because that really seems to work and resonate with people. Uh, this is more magazine statistics and um, this is basically um, all time um, views sorted by, I think this is all time, uh, sorted or maybe just the last year, not that, sorted by country that people come from uh, and uh, it's an order of magnitude, United States people here. Um, I think we, we know we've got a lot of users in other countries as well, so this is one of the ways kind of to look into that. It's one of the things, actually, back to caveats for the Yum Connections. Um, in wealthy Western nations, we have broadband IP, and our systems are on all the time, and our connections aren't metered, um, hopefully. So we uh, tend to have a lot of you know, the Yum Connections that are pretty good from the United States, and broadband. Um, other countries where it's uh, more sketchy connectivity, those connections, uh, it's more of a mystery what, what's going on there. So this is a little bit, and obviously that's where our kind of English slant is as well to our magazine. Uh, but uh, in addition to the United States, uh, we have a pretty, pretty solid viewership from around the world. So it's, 
metric um, that is, uh, thanks to Remy for a couple of these slides here. Uh, this is basically the number of people who have provided feedback in Bodhi, the update system, uh, which is basically if, if uh, a update, if our package is coming out, I'm sure everybody knows this for the record, an update is coming out, you can go to Bodhi and say, yes, this worked for me, no, this didn't work for me. And so this is uh, by year here basically, uh, Graph looks off from what we were saying before. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, I don't have the, yeah, this, this isn't the scale I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, we had over the last year about a thousand different people give feedback on packages, and that number is growing. So I think that's a kind of a nice other metric of the community. And so it's, uh, we've got a you know, kind of core group of people who are in this room or in you know, Flock and FloodCon conferences everywhere else. But it's nice to see that we've got a really broad base of people who are doing you know, kind of small level of testing, which really helps out with things a lot. Um, and I hope in future versions this will have some more metrics along in measuring the community there. Um, this is one that uh, I like. This is the uh, meetings per month here for the last three years here at IRC. So this is IRC meetings, not in-person meetings or video meetings or anything else. Uh, and so uh, we had last year a uh, 1,066 IRC meetings, which is quite, and that's just, that's not people like hanging in IRC chatting, um, that's, you know, an actual formalized meeting of some sort, and it had um, almost 800 so far this year, so on track to uh, beat last year for the number of <laughs> IRC meetings. Uh, so that's a huge amount of activity that's going on in Fedora, and I think uh, that's cool for one thing, so it shows how uh, vibrant we are, but it's also, uh, buried in IRC, and I think probably, again, most people here are pretty comfortable with that. We live in IRC as a project, but this is something with a lot of Fedora activity where if you go to the Fedora website, you don't see how much is going on every day in uh, making Fedora. So I want to look at ways we can bring that uh, to be more visible. And again, the Fedora hubs with IRC integration um, is interesting there. Um, we've got a new site um, that the apps team made that presents the meeting logs and kind of a nice visualization there. And Remy has a thing that makes word clouds from these meetings. Uh, so some of the presentations just sort of bring this activity uh, to be more visible, I think is going to be a, an interesting thing. Because I think when uh, people, you know, when you look at Fedora, when you look at any sort of open source project, it's nice to see how active that project is. What's going on? Is this something where I can, where if I, you know, uh, if I make a bug report, <laughs> I would hesitate to say bug reports, but if I, if I want to interact with the project, are they going to be there? Is there somebody around? And the answer for Fedora is, yeah, we are definitely around all the time and doing things. Uh, but if you go to the website, you know, the wiki, we've got millions of dead pages on the wiki. Um, so a lot, bringing a lot of these things to be more visible, I think, would be a useful thing to do. Uh, okay, uh, switching <coughs> entirely to a different metric here again. Um, this is the uh, uh, Copers versus Koji for um, last year and this year. Uh, so the <coughs> number of builds in Koji, number of builds in uh, Copers. And so the point here basically is that uh, Copers is, uh, we're sure doing a lot more in Koji as well, um, but Copers is also uh, e even more taking off. Um, and Yuri Eichmann, I'm sorry, I cannot say that check R thing even a little bit, so I'm just going to pretend it's an American. Uh, had an interesting blog post about uh, how Copers is uh, taking off and being uh, very successful, and kind of also at the same time that the number of packages in the main Fedora collection has leveled off. Uh, I was talking to Peter Robinson about that the other night, and he made the point that uh, just because it's leveling off doesn't mean that we're not adding new packages. We're actually still adding new packages at a big rate. We're also retiring older ones. So as we get up to about the uh, 20,000 package level in the main collection, um, I think it's reasonable to think about, do we actually want that main collection to grow to 40,000 or 60,000? Or is it better if we have this other space which has sort of the um, growing out to 100,000 and then try and keep that core to be uh, maybe, maybe even smaller, but keep the quality higher in that level. So that's just, you know, Fedora ring stuff that I've been talking about for a while. Um, and so there's kind of ongoing things there. Um, okay, this ends the random statistics section of this talk. Uh, does anyone
anybody have any random st uh, statistics questions to answer real quick? Yeah. the number jumped up so much in Koji? I don't know. Um, I think it actually might be due to the scratch builds that are being done automatically. No? Okay, so um, does anybody from Release Engineering have an idea why that number jumped up so much? Not because of the way they exclude the factories or stuff like that. Some of it would be that we didn't go last year and we did do one this year. Okay, so mass rebuild this year, didn't do one last year, that, that might be some of it. Um, Okay. Yeah, one more on step. You mentioned that uh, about a year ago, when tons of people stopped using the Fedora 14. Yeah. I think that's because um, a lot of things have stopped trying to use the Fedora Hammond. Because Fedora 14 is still actually used in Gnome 2, and it's not used in GNOME 2. Yeah, right. So, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of speculation about why we had a, a, a big drop in the Fedora 15 numbers. And so one thing, one possibility is that people were holding on um, for 14 until the Mate desktop became available. I'm not sure what the number of downloads we have for the Mate desktop, if that explains the amount of jump there, but it, it possibly could. Um, it, and some, some of those things are things that, you know, if we had that, that number that, you know, the thing said what edition you're using, um, we could get some <laughs> better statistics on that kind of thing. Okay, uh, so uh, current current state of things. Fedora 23 Alpha came out um, on time yesterday with a little bit of uh, don't don't look at the sausage. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, that definitely is deserving of applause. Uh, so we are well underway and nominally on. 
on schedule for our Halloween release this year, so that's that's very exciting. Um, I actually, uh, I think that everybody here is probably, uh, or a lot of people here are kind of in the midst of working on it, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into the details of what the alpha is, except for I want to, uh, don't read the actual text here, it's just blah, blah, blah. Uh, one of the things that, um, as someone who talked to the press about Fedora and some of the, the Fedora marketing team, uh, it is nice to have a story for what this release is about. So for Fedora 21, we had the first release with Fedora Next, looked at our shiny new editions. Uh, for Fedora 22, we had a little bit of, yeah, and then we put some polish on that. Um, so it would be nice to have a, um, a kind of a, a story that the press or anybody can kind of grab into, you know, what, what, what should I talk about with this release? So if you're interested in helping us figure that out, um, join the Fedora marketing group. Um, you're just basically saying, you know, uh, we kind of updated uh, Python to a new version, and there's a new GCC, and all this is mildly interesting, but it's kind of expected of Fedora, so it's nice to have things that can be headline grabbing. Um, I am hoping that uh, some of the work we're doing with Fedora Atomic will generate some interest, doing a two-week cycle for the Fedora Atomic release, um, but uh, we'll have to see uh, where that goes, but um, please join the marketing group and help. Joe. If you would like to get involved with that, my talk on marketing is at 4.30 tomorrow. Okay, there's a talk on marketing Joe is leading at 4.30 tomorrow, so um, yeah, come, come to that. Okay, uh, Fedora governance as well. Um, last flock we had an awesome meeting run by Heikel and Toshio about how we were going to uh, reform the Fedora top level governance. Um, and then after that meeting, we, over the course of months, did it. Um, so Thursday at 10, there is a full session um, with the current Fedora Council. So uh, again, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of details here, um, but we have this new governance model in place. Um, and actually we um, try and make it a leadership model as well. The distinction governance is making sure resources um, are allocated and responding to requests and leadership is kind of helping to set direction for the project. And I think, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit in the next couple slides here, actually. Uh, one of the things that I think is an exciting thing is that uh, the council is consensus decision-based and a lot of times lazy consensus, which means we don't need to wait for a full vote of everything in order to move. That lets us uh, kind of cross things off the list without making sure everybody's around in a, a quorum, or as long as nobody's objecting, we can actually go ahead and do things. And the consensus-based model also means that uh, we have to worry a little bit less about the actual right proportion of uh, people from different parts of the project, because if even if there's only one person who represents um, you know, QA or some, some area, um, that one person can say, wait, stop, we're not gonna move ahead until the, the concerns of my constituency are satisfied. Uh, and we've got some the blah, blah, blah governance details about how, to, how that all works. But I think that's an interesting and exciting model for a project like Fedora. Um, and we also have a lot of a lot of this is set up so that um, me, it's all for me, um, as Fedora project leader, um, I don't get burned out as much. So a lot of it's kind of sharing the load between the rest of the council members. So we have Remy De Cosmaker on board um, from OSAS at Red Hat, and he is. <laughs> not just helping put together this awesome conference, but um, it's, the, it's the action and impact, community action and impact lead. Um, and so we've been working on a lot of things, trying to actually you know, grow the community, the Fedora community, and grow the Fedora user base, and uh, provide support to that growth. So that's exciting. Um, we are in the process of choosing a diversity advisor to add to the council as well. Um, and that's, um, kind of an on ongoing thing right now. I kind of hope to have that by now, but we're still still working out the details. Um, and that will be a uh, basically somebody on the council who can um, give input to any sort of decisions we're making that sort of imp impact community and contributor diversity. And I think that's a really important thing for any open source project these days. And not open source as well, but somewhere where we can show leadership in Fedora. Um, and then the other thing we have on the council is this idea of objective talk a little bit about objectives here. Uh, basically, uh, if you don't 
know where you're going, how do you know when you got there? Um, the idea with Fedora is that we've, we've had this uh, kind of very high mission statement of uh, leading the open source and open content community. And, and I should be able to quote it offhand, but it's a, it's a um, very ambitious and it's a good mission statement, but it's very high up. And so a lot of the times what we've done is make a distribution and here's our mission about leading, leading the world of open source. And the connection between those is kind of lost. And I think um, this is a thing I'm having, I'm gonna plug my talk at LinuxCon. I'm gonna have a whole talk about this sort of method of strategic planning. This is something from, um, this is an ASCII art chart I drew, drew. You see I'm kind of proud of it, so I put it in this version. I think for my talk at LinuxCon, I will have a, a uh, shinier version, but here it is. Uh, basically, this is a way of connecting that high mission statement at the end <laughs> to something that is um, actually, what is the impact of, of the actual things that you're doing? And the basic idea is you plan from the right side, the high level, and then your actual actions come across from the left side. And so, anyway, without going way, way too much on that, uh, the point of this is that on the council we have objectives, um, which the council selects between two or four, two to four of these. My goodness, I'm running out of time already. Jeez. Okay. Uh, so we select some objectives and we have tried to uh, move towards making those objectives happen over the course of an actual defined time frame. We'll talk more about those in the council sessions. Um, I would like to use these objectives in the future for things like selecting which talks get priority at Flock, which funding goes, uh, where, where funding goes for all sorts of things, priorities in general. Uh, and so I think it's very important that we as a community make sure that the two to four objectives we've officially selected represent the things we want to focus on overall. And then having selected that, we can actually follow that focus. Uh, here are our current ones right now, um, the, the Fedora editions, um, Steve Gallagher and SLED, and that is wrapping up right now, so that's going to be an empty empty slot for a new objective that we can talk about at this conference, what other things we want to focus on. Uh, below that, we've got a university outreach objective that Remy is leading up, and then Langdon is also leading an objective having to do with Fedora modularization and Fedora rings. Um, come to Denise's talk on what Red Hat wants to hear some more about Red Hat's perspective on that whole idea. Um, and then this is the um, basic idea. Uh, again, we've got these empty objectives. The idea is where, where do we want to go 12 months from now? Not where do we want to go in 10 years, but what are we going to do? What do we want to do over the next year? And I don't have a magical answer to that, although I think some of those things I've talked about are important. Um, I want to have you know, more community visibility. I want to grow the user base. I want to work on this modularization thing. I've got some ideas, but it really shouldn't just be my ideas. It should be all of your ideas. So let's take those ideas and come together and you know, make some of these solid objectives for the next next release and then um, go ahead and do them over the course of it. Um, and um, that's pretty much it for my slides. Thank you very much again to all of our awesome, awesome sponsors. Thank you. 